I'm Lavelle Smith Jr. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm a dancer, choreographer, producer, and director. I've been working with many superstars like Beyonce, George Michael, Rolling Stones, Rihanna, Usher, Janet Jackson, and so many others. But I'm more known for working over 23 years with the one and only King of Pop, my friend, Michael Jackson. According to the L.A. Times, Michael Jackson has been pronounced dead. One of the world's most loved and greatest pop stars that we will probably ever know in our whole entire lifetime. There, there are still conflicting reports. The pop star Michael Jackson has died. Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson is dead. Michael no. Jackson, no. Michael Jackson is are you being dead. serious? Michael Jackson is dead. No. No, 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 we're not taking that. Michael Jackson is not dead. You know? No, Michael Jackson cannot be dead. He's not there. No, whoa. He's not there. Are you serious? He's yeah, no, he's died. He died of a heart attack tonight in LA. A heart attack? Oh, God, are you serious? My brother, the legendary king of pop, Michael Jackson, passed away on Thursday, June 25th, 2009 at 2.26 p.m. CNN was calling me, all the news agencies were calling me. Because for me, when I heard it, I thought, oh, okay, it's, 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 it's just a way to get out of doing all those ridiculous, stupid concerts. And then they kept saying it. You know, first it was a Michael Jackson coma. No, no, sorry, first heart attack, then coma then dead and I was like okay come on okay come on and I called immediately I called the office and they said Lavelle is true we can't talk right now but we promise we're going to call you back and explain everything and tell you but that's what I knew was real you know This can't be true. Or it just, it just, it's impossible. This just cannot be true. And I remember sitting on the edge of my bed, just sitting there and kind of in a numb, kind of gone, someplace else kind of state. And then I got up, went to the living room. I remember hearing my mom crying. And she was just saying, oh, poor Catherine, poor Catherine, over and over. And that's when I realized that, oh yeah, you know, I lost a friend and, uh, you know, someone that I love to work with, but it's, um, it's more personal than that. And my mother kind of brought it back to me and helped me realize and see that it's, um, yes, the world has lost a major talent, but that family has lost a son, a brother, a father. And that is bigger than anything else. <laughs> Sorry. And then as you find out, he died from an overdose of medication that is prescribed, not prescribed, but is, has to be given to you intravenously by a doctor. I thought, huh, wow, this is very strange. But at the same time, I think that those things didn't, didn't stay in my mind. Michael took medication, obviously, 
because of the burn in his scalp that never really healed from the Pepsi burn from that commercial. And I know that burns are, from what I understand, my mother's a nurse. She says burns are very, very, they're hard to heal, but they're also very, very painful. So I don't know when he started taking pain medication, but no, I never saw it affect his work at all. No, not at all. Um, I was shocked when I found out he was taking pain, pain medication, but it didn't surprise me because, like I say, that burn never healed and properly. And also, I know he hurt his ankle, and I think he had other other you know aches and pains as dancers always do. And you know, Michael would throw his body down to the ground and think nothing of it. I would love to. I'm sorry. Uh, walk on stage again, you know. I'm sorry. I would like to be on st- Can you imagine, you know, that, that feeling is was so beautiful. But I know he's not, he's not. We have the music and we have the videos and I think we have to cherish that, but yes, I, it, 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 it stunned me beyond belief. But to be honest, I was so numb. It was so shocking that I had no emotions for a year. And then once um, I did a TV show, Move Like Michael Jackson, and you know, know, interviews like this, and they asked me, you know, everything. And I said, um, I kept saying to them, Michael Jackson is, and they said, Cut, Mr. Smith, you have to say was. It's past tense. And I said, okay, I got it. My production is. I said it again and again. But um it it and the the moment, the very moment I said Michael Jackson was, I lost it. Cause it's it's final when you admit to yourself that your best friend, your good friend, your dear friend is dead, it's final. like he died yesterday. It doesn't go away. You know, it's like my grandparents, my nana and my papa. It's like yesterday, so it doesn't go away. He was somebody that we were blessed as humans to have on this planet for this much time. But I really think that he's one of the most um, intelligent people I've ever talked to. You know, we could talk about every subject. We could talk about physics, you know, why the universe works. We could talk about everything and we could go back and forth this way. But um, Michael is um, super intelligent. We could talk about diverse things. Well, for instance, Michael thought that Thomas Edison was the greatest inventor of all times, and I thought Nikola Tesla was inventor, unsung inventor, inventor of all times. So we discussed things like that, and we, you know, each person would say why they thought the way they did. We would do it like that, and, and you know, some some things that we would discuss were never never solved. We would disagree to disagree, you know, in a gentlemanly way. But when it came to work, 
there was there was never argument. If if you love somebody, well, regardless, you don't want to see them dead. It's like your grandparents dying. You know, we know our grandparents are going to die because you know that's you know that's what life is. You know, we're born to die, but and our or our mothers and fathers, we don't want to see that. But when you see a brother, and he was so young, you know, I am almost the age that he was when he died. And I, I, yeah, it's just hard. It's hard to see that, you know. There was so much more life to give. He was going to do, in my mind, he was going to do so many more brilliant things. But I'm going to keep trying my best to to do and share and continue the love. That's what I, that's, I have to. part of me, you know. He taught me how to, you know, how to perform on stage and how to give the audience what they want and to to say to yourself, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to give my best and I'm going to do it. He taught me these things. So, and that's why I do what I do. That's why I do the workshops. We have to in this way, we have to continue his um, legacy of love and of kindness and of all the things that I feel that the world has lost. You know, when somebody like that dies, we don't just lose the, the human, you know, because we know the spirit lives forever. So, but we do lose, we do lose um, kindness. And um, I guess one thing I could always say to everybody out there who's a Michael Jackson fan, keep the love alive. Mr. Jackson, in the latter portion of 1993, there were some allegations leveled at you concerning improper conduct with some young boys. Uh, I assume you're familiar with the fact that those allegations were raised. Is that right? Yes. I was by Michael's side for the first two allegations. If I was there and I ever suspected that he was doing that, I would have went to the police myself and turned my friend in. It's a disgusting act. And I know Michael Jackson didn't have one bone in his body to do something like this. People would say to me, why am I so convinced that these allegations aren't true? After all, I wasn't there. And I would say to them, I spent so much time with Michael, and I watched everything, and I really believe in my heart that I know the man. And I just know that's not something that he's capable of doing. Michael loved children in a way that helped him relive his childhood. And in children, I believe Michael saw the future, the future of America, the future of our world. And I don't think he'd ever do anything to hurt a child. It broke his heart to see children without things, without homes, without medication, children in burn units. That broke his heart. And I just believe and am convinced that because of those reasons, it would never hurt a child. And of course, I wasn't there, but if you look at the picture in its totality, the allegations are, they're flimsy at best, ever-changing and morphing. And like I said, and I'll say it again, I knew the man. And the man I know is not capable of that kind of thing. I, I, I think that when you, you get to know somebody like Michael, 
you realize it's impossible. You know, it's just not possible. And it, like I say, if I thought for one second, I'd go to the police myself. But that's just not him. It's really not. You know, I love Michael so much that he said some things where I thought to myself, idiot, don't say you sleep in bed with children. It just sounds gross. But I, knowing him, I thought, I know how he meant it. And, um, but I said, you know, this is, this is our relationship. I said, dude, really? You said that? Idiot. Idiot move. And, um, of course, you know, Michael being Michael said to me, why, why, why? And I said, boom, 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 boom. He's like, oh, that's what they think? I'm like, yes, that's what they think. You're a weirdo. I believe Michael went on with his life. I think an innocent man, well, let's say this. I think a guilty man would have done everything in his power to distance himself from children or the appearance of anything that, that may look strange involving, you know, them and children. But then you have an innocent man. An innocent man has nothing to hide. An innocent man continues his life. A man that knows he's done nothing wrong is going to live his life as normally as possible, even after being accused of something so heinous. You're not going to change your life knowing that you've done nothing wrong. So yes, children were around. And yeah, that's, that's what an innocent man does. You still continue your life. If you have children over to your house, for cookouts and um, watch movies, you're going to continue your life as normal. But if you are a guilty man, you're going to do everything you can to separate and distance yourself away from children. So I think, if anything, that shows more of his innocence by continuing to live the way that he lived, loving children, helping children, and making sure children had things that they needed. I'm not sure how the allegations in the trial in 2005 affected my goal, but when you put yourself in his shoes, just for a moment, you know that has to be one of the most frightening and terrifying things that you have to deal with in life. But Michael Strong, he used to always say to me, in this business and in life, in general, you have to have skin like a rhino, rhinoceros, like a rhino. And of course, the only thing I knew about rhinos is that they have, they're big and they have horns. But he explained to me that they they actually have a very very thick skin. Just you know, that's just the way they are. They're born. Um, and so he'd always say that. He said that more than once, many times in this business and in life. You have to have skin like a rhino. So him saying that to me makes me think that he was able to withstand a lot of scrutiny. Obviously, we've seen the press and just from. From the moment he became famous, there's always been, you know, they kind of build you up to tear you down kind of thing. And so I think he got used to really being ridiculed, raked over the coals, nicknames, uh, being made fun of, being talked about badly. And I think he developed a very thick skin. So in my mind, I'm pretty sure, even though the 2005, you know, allegations and then trial, I know it had to be tough on him and his family. But I'm sure that he put that into effect. He just put on his armor, his rhinoceros skin, and dealt with it. But, you know, human. He's a human man, so you know it was ripping him up inside. It was tearing him up inside. It was hard. But I was a strong man. So as hard as it was, he dealt with it. And we all saw it. It was hard, but every day, going to court, dealing with it best you can. That's the kind of man he was. People used to ask me, uh, why does he love you so much? Because I tell him the truth. I tell him, you know, like I just said, that's a dumb move, dude. That was stupid. I don't um, make it pretty. That was stupid. It's like a brother. You don't, you tell your brother the truth. And so he's my brother, and so I tell him the truth. Michael and I, did discuss the allegations, but it was usually in passing. It wasn't a topic of conversation that I would have 
brought up to discuss. But if it came up, we would talk about it. And you could always see the pain. The pain and the... I think him just not really understanding why this is happening and why it would happen again. It was hard for him to understand. And I think he just felt like, you know, maybe people were out to get him. And I think that was something that was always on his mind. But whenever we talked about it, you could just see the pain in his face. And you could feel that pain when he spoke about it. It was something that really ripped at him. It tore at his heart. And I think, you know, you, you felt you felt bad for him because you know this is someone who doesn't want to hurt anybody, doesn't have an evil bone in his body, and he's being attacked from all sides. And I just think that, uh, yeah, that pain, it was there. But Michael, being a professional and being the man he is, the show must go on. He would always take it out on the stage and you'd never know that his heart was breaking. And I'm sure also knowing Michael, he would use that pain in some of the songs. The explosive reaction to that disturbing Michael Jackson documentary, Leaving Neverland. It focuses on two men who accused Jackson of abusing them when they were children. And Chris Connolly joins us now with the fallout from this devastating film. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, George. The documentary Leaving Neverland has been gathering attention ever since its first showing at the Sundance Film Festival in January. Now that it's aired on HBO, it's sparking conversation and strong opinions nationwide about the life and the legacy of the late Michael Jackson. Do you really want the truth, my truth? You're gonna bleep a lot of this. <laughs> Why? He gave you everything, and um, it's heartless to do that to a man that can't defend himself. So why? I hate to say why I think they're doing it, but I'm going to say it. Money. Dollar signs. These people, they are bankrupt. They are corrupted. They will sell their souls to the devil. I'm sure a lot of us have thought, how would Michael react to this, what's happening now, these allegations, if he were alive? And at first I always think to myself, this would not be happening if Michael was alive. It just simply would not be happening. They wouldn't have the guts to do this if he were alive. But let's say on the out chance, on the, the remote possibility that he would react and that they would have the guts to actually uh, throw these allegations in his face if he were alive. He would be himself. And he would stand up and say, you know this isn't true. And I'm sure he could tell us so much, much more of why it's not true and how he could prove it wasn't true and the reasons behind what's happening. There's a lot we don't know. And I'm sure he'd be able to shed light on what is actually behind it and what they want to get out of it. And he'd be able to tear it down, knock it down, brick by brick by brick. But let's be honest, if Michael Jackson were alive, this would not be happening, plain and simple.
I did a TV show with Wade in London, dance show, helps the judge. And so yeah, of course. I've known Wayne his I mean, Wade his whole life since he was ten. I was there when Michael met him. But I believe that we have to listen to the people who say they've been abused. Women, men, whatever. And really look at it and say is it true? We have to look at it. We, we, we can't just dismiss it like it didn't happen. We have to say maybe it did. And I've done all my research and I know it didn't happen. And you guys are liars. And um, there's a special place in hell for you. You know? But when a dead man is abused that way, it's just, it's weak sauce. It's just weak sauce. It was Smooth Criminal, 1980-something, and I remember watching him from a distance across the room and watching him do amazing things. And I thought to myself, whoa, this guy's amazing. This guy's amazing. Smooth Criminal turned out to be one of the best jobs of my life. But I remember looking and saying, oh gosh, you know, the rumors are true. He's amazing. But um, I also remember feeling it. You know, from, from way over across the room, I felt that, that magic. And yeah, it's no criminal. If I told you that Snoop Criminal was one of the best things that I've ever done as a dancer, it's true. It was like being on a sound stage in the golden age of Hollywood, creating a musical. And for that reason, yeah, it's one of the best things I've ever done as a dancer. So happy to have been a part of that, so thankful. Um, of course, there's Super Bowl, there's so many other ones, but for that time frame, and when I first got to LA, my first big, big job, it was Snoop Criminal, and yes, it was like making an old, golden era of Hollywood musical and it was it was awesome I learned a lot the first time I went to Neverland of course it was exciting I was over the moon with excitement but you pull in and you drive for a while and then you start to see it and it's just beautiful um, and then of course as you get closer you get out of your car you start to hear the music and it just kind of awakens something in you like a child you feel like a child. It's um, it's beautiful, and the sounds and the smells, and it's just an experience that I'll never forget. Michael gave me a tour, and of course he took me on the train, uh, showed me the lake, the zoo, the rides, the theater, the dance room, of course. That's where we spent a lot of time. And just kind of showed me everything, and I was just amazed, and I thought, wow, you know, He's built a paradise here for himself. The first time I went to Neverland was for the creation of the original Dangerous. And that was for the American Music Awards. It was the first time I got to do something televised for Michael. I had choreographed Jam for the Dangerous Tour, the opening number. And then he called me on the phone and said, well, I'd like to give you your first chance to choreograph something big for me. And then he called me into Neverland, called me down to Neverland. And um, we went there and went in that dance room and just started creating. I would love to sit here and tell you that I'm amazing and it's all me. I'm just, it's God, it's a gift from God, but yes, but you know, hard work, hard work. Michael Jackson, as we all, you know, talk about, was a perfectionist, but he would push me, push me, push me to the edge of insanity to get the best out of me. And, um, you know, every artist I've worked with, uh, Beyonce and all the others, 
they're lucky because the man pushed me to be a perfectionist and to always expect the best from myself and always to give my best, give my all, give everything you have. More people, okay. okay. I'm gonna count one, wait, pick it up. One, two, three, four, bam! Now you gotta do it again. One, two, three, four. Right, now, now do the scoop. One, two, three, four. And the camera just move around and come out. It'll come out. I gotcha. Look, I, I gotcha. want dust on this the, way. Okay, dust, dust on the floor and dust on the shoes. Bam! Okay. Okay. Cool, cool. And the snap that we that we wanted, the dust snap. Yeah. And of course the ghoulie, we have a little bit wider and still moving to see it was. Okay. Okay. Well I have pauses between five, six, seven, eight. Again. 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 Yeah, it doesn't Here work. Here we go. Okay. So we can't do it do again. It. Okay, so, we'll so what we have to do is again. we do this thing. Again. So we Bam. Wait, one more. It should start there. That's how it should be framed. Do it again. One, two. Bam. Yeah. That's where it should start. You should hit hard. But don't hit hard. Like it. One, two, two. Uh, yeah, that's how it should do. See? Well, you Dust. want more than one, right? Yeah. See, one would be like that, and one can be here. But I like to have one, like, bam, bam. But no higher than dress him up. See where it's like right about there? But lay down, Lavelle. Lay your head down. So it's just like that. Okay. See? Then when the scoot, when they start scooting, the camera just move out. Okay, okay, the show Move out. Yeah. We used to have a saying, leave it on stage, you know? Leave it on stage. Give it all, all the sweat, all the hard work, leave it on stage. No regrets. When you walk off stage, that's the worst thing. To be like, oh, I wish I'd, no. Michael taught us to not, not just me, you know, all the dancers, leave it on stage. Don't ever walk off with a regret saying, oh, I wish I'd done more. No, give it all. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most remarkable performers in American history, the king of pop, <laughs> Mr. Michael Jackson. We did a, what's it, a Democratic convention for Bill Clinton. He was the president at the time. And um, um, you know how those jobs are. It's a little bit crazy. But Michael said, Lavelle, I'm like, what? Come up here. I want you to meet Bill. I'm like, Bill, what the heck is Bill? But it was Bill Clinton. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, you're our president. It wasn't televised. It was. Um, to raise money for the Democratic Convention. It was amazing. We had flown in from shooting for the American Bandstand 50th anniversary special, so we shot that. We all got on a plane, all the dancers and everyone, and we went to New York and checked into the hotel. And then it started. It was, it was awesome. He was excited, I was excited. Um, Bill Clinton, uh, was there and he was possibly going to do a saxophone solo in a part of black or white but at the last minute he decided he wasn't going to do the solo so we carried on as normal and it just turned out to be a fascinating and historic moment looking back you know we couldn't have seen the future we didn't know what that would be Michael's last befo live performance but it was it was special. I remember, you know, I was working, you know, everybody's doing their own thing, and uh, Michael and Bill Clinton were on stage just talking, and I hadn't even noticed that. And I heard over the microphone, "Lavelle, come to the stage. Come here. Come here." That was he, with excited voice, very excited Michael voice. I didn't know what it was, and then I turned around to look um, at the stage, and I was like, "Oh, he's talking to Bill Clinton. Maybe they're going to do the solo. Maybe maybe the saxophone solo is going to happen now." But anyway, it got to the stage and Michael said, I just want you to meet Bill Clinton. And I remember just shaking his hand and looking, a very tall guy. Bill Clinton was very tall. I had no idea how tall he was. And it was just such an honor, you know, that he took that moment to introduce me to the president of the United States. I just thought that that was a very special moment that I'll never forget. But yeah, the performance itself was, was very nice. We decided to go with a smaller group of dancers 
not the big dangers that we usually do. We had shrunk it down to, I think, six of us, six dancers and Michael, and it was really, these guys, the, all, every dancer there on that stage was just there for Michael. It was so obvious everybody was there for him. And we all just killed it. It felt so natural, so good. And I think even he said, oh, that felt, that felt nice. And it was, a, you know, the audience is there, so it's not a, it's not a, not being taped. It's not a TV special. It's a one time, leave it all on the stage, give it all you got kind of moment. And we did that. And it was beautiful. It was truly beautiful. You know. I must say that Michael introduced me to so many legends. Because of Michael I met Sophia Loren, um, Liz Taylor, Betty Davis. The list is endless. And like I said, I, I can't thank him enough, you know. And like I told you earlier, that's one thing I regret, that I didn't say thank you enough to him for changing my life and being such a big part of my life and, yeah, giving me all that love. I wish I could have said thank you more. I'm ready. 6.48 now. Say when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
say this but he said um they're trying to kill me this I can't I can't do this many concerts and I, I you know when he really explained to me what they wanted him to do I thought oh, dude, you know rethink that contract because that's a lot of work but um that was the, you know I was always supportive so of course I said yes you can you can do it we can do it we can do it together we'll, I'll be there with you until they got rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> 